Hello, good morning. Uh, this is the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. Today is Wednesday, February 10th, 2021 at 9 a.m. meeting. Um, first thing, can I get a, a, a motion to adopt the agenda? Somebody? Uh, Zach, Zach Bell. Um, so we have a nice presentation uh, scheduled, so I'll pass it over to our guests, and then you can deliver your presentation, then we'll ask questions at the end if, if there are some there from the committee. Okay, so I'll pass it over uh, to you. Awesome. Thank you all. Thanks for having me this morning. Um, my name is Hunter Gando. I'm a proud Islander, resident of Charlottetown, and uh, Islander that lives with CF myself. Um, cystic fibrosis is the most common fatal genetic disease affecting young Canadians. It mainly affects the lungs and digestive system by way of producing a thick, sticky mucus that clogs the airways and the digestive system, as well as many other organ systems like the reproductive system, the renal system, and many others. Um, there's 43 to 4,400 people in Canada that have this disease. Um, of which 50% of us will die before the age of 40. In the past five years on PEI, we've lost three islanders to CF with a median age of 32. Um, in CF, lung infections are, are a common cause of hospitalization and further medical intervention. Um, but it's with, with great hope that we have the announcement of a drug called Trikafta. So Trikafta is a genetic modulator which treats the underlying cause of CF by fixing the mutated gene in people with CF, thus repairing most of the things that come with having CF. This is much different than the current treatments available for CF that are treating the symptoms, so antibiotics, in different inhaled medications to help you try to clear that uh, mucus, whereas Trikafta fixes the genetic mutation and allows the body to function more normally. Um, it's what we're calling the, the greatest scientific advancement in CF history. There's been nothing like this before. Uh, it can treat 90% of people with CF, which is a huge jump from the, the modulars that came before this one that would treat 2 or 3% of genetic mutations in people with CF. Um, this particular drug was first approved in the U.S. in October of 2019, so over a year ago now and has since been approved in 20 other countries. Um, Trikafta, we are considering to be both a precision medicine by targeting specific genetics and a preventative medicine, where if we could get this to younger people earlier in disease, they would have greater health outcomes and longer life expectancies. Uh, a recent study by Dalhousie University showed that if Canada was to have broad access to Trikafta in 2021, it would extend the life expectancy of a person with CF in Canada to over nine years longer than the current life expectancy by 2030. Um, currently, Trikafta is before Health Canada and Cadith and Aness in Quebec. So Health Canada has granted the manufacturer what's called an aligned review, where the health technology bodies and Health Canada look at the data together at the same time, both do their reviews and then either give it an approval or a positive recommendation roughly around the same time. Um, like I said, this is the wonder drug that we've been waiting decades to come. It's the closest thing we've ever had to a cure. I think the most profound description I've ever had of this drug was about a week after its approval, my doctor in Halifax had called me and said, listen, there's this new drug called Trikafta, and it is the closest thing to a cure that we have ever seen. The only reason we're not calling it a cure is because if you stop taking the drug, your symptoms would slowly start to come back. Other than that, this is what we've been waiting for. Um, in people with CF, the the most common measures are lung function and sweat chloride. So the, the mutation in the cells it, uh, prevents 
free flowing chloride around your body which creates that mucus and the other problems um, and patients on Trikafta have seen that sweat chloride level drop in as little as a hundred days so in in the diagnosis of CF a sweat chloride of 0 to 30 would be a definite negative diagnosis between 30 and 60 they'd probably investigate a little bit more and anything above 60 is a definite CF positive diagnosis. Um, a good example is a, a woman in Ontario who is currently on Trikafta through a special access program. Uh, she's 23 years old and her sweat chloride before going on to Trikafta was 103. After 90 days on the drug, her sweat chloride was 21. This year, is a, I'm a big graphics guy. I think this really speaks to the impact of this drug. It's a basic line graph of lung function over time. That line on the bottom you can see is the uh, patients on the placebo in the clinical trials, and they ended up with a net decrease in lung function in as little as 16 weeks. And then that red line is the patient on Trikafta, which in as little as 14 days, we see this huge dramatic increase in lung function of 14%, which is sustained over the 16 weeks. And we see in the thousands of patients around the world that are on this drug now that that is a sustained improvement, if not further more than that. Now, a 6 14% sorry lung function doesn't seem like a whole lot 14 is a very big number but to people with CF 14% lung function is oftentimes life or death my lung function at present is 66% and a 14% jump in that lung function would be life changing so this is a a diagram of the complex road to getting drugs approved and into patients' hands in Canada. The ones highlighted in green are either completed or currently underway, and the ones in red are yet to be completed. So like I said, uh, it's been submitted to Health Canada for approval with an aligned review by Cadith, and we're expecting that by June 22nd of this year, both of those reviews should be complete at which point it would turn to the PCPA to negotiate for this drug on behalf of the provinces. Uh, the PCPA is currently in negotiations with this same manufacturer for the two drugs that came before this drug that treat different mutations than Trikafta does. And we're hopeful that with pressure, the provinces have added Trikafta into this negotiation, knowing that it's coming so that once it does have a positive recommendation by Cadith and signed off by Health Canada that we can quickly roll it into the hands of patients. Um, different than other provinces obviously is the PEI Drugs and Therapeutics Committee that we're hoping is going to align with what we're assuming is going to be a glowing review by Cadith considering the incredible impact that this medication has on patients. And then finally at the end would be patients getting publicly funded access to this drug, which is our main priority, is getting this into the hands of patients that need it yesterday. Uh, specifically on PEI, there's 23 islanders that have CF. Uh, I believe eight of those are children, the remainder are adults. Um, now, like I said, a lot of uh, people that are on Trikafta in as little as sometimes months, but definitely in 100 days, they can come off of many of the other treatments that they're on, which if you see there on the second line is, is not just a couple puffers and you know a couple pills every day. Myself, I do two hours of chest physiotherapy every single day to clear the mucus out of my lungs as well as an hour of inhaled antibiotics that I've taken every day for the past 15 years, and then roughly 20 to 30 pills throughout the day. This, for many CF patients, works out to be roughly four months of full-time work of just life-sustaining therapies in the course of a year. Now, we're in a particular situation on Prince Edward Island where there is no CF care on the island, so all of us have to travel to Halifax to be seen either at the QE2 or the IWK by the CF clinics there. 
Uh, this is much different than many other provinces where they have several CF clinics and most often there'll be a CF clinic in the city that you live in. Um, I'm going to turn it to you guys for questions. I've, I'm very excited to take your questions. This is a topic I'm extremely passionate about and I'm hoping that with the help of this committee we can uh, <coughs> excuse me, get this drug into the hands of Islanders. Um, the most important first move for us would be to get the Minister of Health to commit to expediting the Provincial Drugs and Therapeutics Committee review. That's something that we believe with the data that Cadith will be able to provide should be a very cut and dry, clear, easy decision that this drug needs to be in the hands of Islanders immediately. And then further to that, we need to know that Islanders are going to have sustainable and immediate access to this drug by way of the provincial formulary. Um, the Minister of Health of Newfoundland has written a, a public letter committing to listing this drug as soon as these processes are complete. And we know that by way of the PCPA negotiations that commitments from provinces prior to completing those negotiations would help the PCPA leverage its ability to negotiate with the manufacturer if the manufacturer was to know how many units, say, of this drug that they're actually going to be selling within the country. That's everything. Thank you. Good. Very good. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, I'll just turn it over to the committee. Yeah, we'll start with Trish. Great. Thank you, Chair. And Hunter, thank you so much for your presentation today. And uh, I know you're, you've, uh, you're an incredible advocate uh, um, for the CF community, and so I thank you for, for bringing this to our attention. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, you mentioned that there's no, first of all, there's no CF care or access to care on Prince Edward Island. So can you tell me a little bit more about how often CF patients need to travel off island and what types of services um, uh, we would need to have available here in Prince Edward Island uh, so that that wouldn't be necessary? Yeah, definitely. So a healthy CF patient that isn't undergoing any current lung infections or health complications would go and see the CF clinic in Halifax at least once every three months, which is a trip to Halifax. It's an entire day at the hospital, different tests like lung function tests, uh, sputum cultures that test what bacteria you're growing at that time, reviews of your medication, refills, different procedures while you're there. and. In some cases, when you do have an exacerbation and you do have a lung infection, that clinic asks that you be sent to Halifax as an inpatient so that they can watch you during that time. So in order to do that here, we would need, one, the, the medical professionals that work in that field and a permanent CF clinic that Islanders could be treated here, say, at the QEH. Um, we do have some CF inpatients here where if it's, I say not serious, but a less serious exacerbation where you're admitted to the hospital, they can treat here at the QEH and have consultations with the specialists in Halifax every day. But outside of an inpatient stay here, that's about the, the extent of CF care on the island. Trish? Yes, okay. So. Um, so what would you see as the first steps to increase access to care on the island uh, for CF patients? Uh, a, a great first step would be an establishment of a clinic and the recruitment of the, the specialists needed to facilitate that clinic. It, it sounds very easy, I guess, as a, a clinic, but because of how wide ranging the effects of CF are. There's a lot more clinicians involved in the CF clinic than most. There's physiotherapists, dietitians, respirologists, uh, nurse practitioners, there's psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers. So we would, we would need to recruit those people and have them available to the CF patients to be able to start by building a CF clinic here. Trish? Thank you, Chair. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, and uh, about uh, the uh, um, uh, Trikafta medication that, uh, you know, the drug that is currently going through the approval process with, with Health uh, Canada um, and, uh, you know, uh, and 
uh, and Cadith. So you said June is sort of the expected timelines for that to be through that process. Um, and you mentioned uh, requesting that the uh, the minister expedite the process through the uh, provincial committee uh, to review uh, to have that drug included on the provincial formulary. So have you had a, any commitment from uh, the either the current Minister of Health or the previous Minister. Of course, we've just had a, a change, but yeah. yeah. Um, I had an email from the current Minister of Health yesterday just saying that the, the PCPA negotiations are underway and that this drug is a major consideration in those uh, negotiations and that given, given the negotiations are positive and, and in a successful way that they would be more than happy to put it through the, the process here on the island, but no firm commitment as of yet to expediting that process and furthermore listing it on the formulary. Trish? Okay, good. So, um, I mean, I, I can uh, certainly appreciate the, the concern overall in terms of whether or not it would be included on the formulary, just that we do have some of the, the lowest coverage in, in Canada in terms of uh, drugs on the formulary overall, so per capita spending on um, access to drugs. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm quite hopeful, or I hope, I guess not quite hopeful, but I do hope that the minister recognizes that we need to increase funding for the formulary so that life-saving drugs um, uh, like Trikafta can be uh, included as well when they are uh, approved because this, you know, uh, the, the results uh, that we're hearing from this medication are, are truly incredible and no doubt uh, the quality of life uh, for those with, with CF would, would greatly improve with this medication. So again, I just want to thank you uh, for sharing this with us. Um, that's all for now, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Sydney? Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Harvey, so much for your presentation. I really appreciate it and all the work that, that you do. Um, I'm happy to hear that the minister, the new minister got back to you as well. Uh, the A couple of questions. So we were talking about the We'd like to see the the minister expedite the the appro or the process here. Um, uh, I'll be honest; I don't know how how that works, but I'm I want you to help. So this committee is able to make recommendations when they report back to the legislature. So in order for this committee to make a strong its strongest recommendation possible, to say the minister should expedite this. Do you know of any other examples of of, uh, of instances where that has happened, where they've They've put this through faster than, say, some of the other ones that they're putting through. Because no doubt there's the same similar lobby for, for other groups that are trying to get drugs through. Do you know an example or, or other places, you know, like you said, Newfoundland has, has, has said that they're going to do it immediately. You know, help us strengthen our case even more with a recommendation. Yeah, so I don't know of any specific drugs on Prince Edward Island that have had uh, PEI's <coughs> portion of that review expedited. Mm -hmm. But at the Cadith level, and even specifically with Trikafta's movement through Cadith, which my understanding of this PEI Drugs and Therapeutics Committee isn't, isn't vast. It's kind of a, a secretive committee, it seems, that there is not much information on of the members or who runs it or how many people are involved in that review. But as far as the Cadith review, uh, which I'm assuming is going to be similar, a uh, health technology assessment of sorts, um, this drug has been granted a uh, fast track through Cadith, which uh, moves that timeline to 180 days from upwards of a year, where they will accept the supporting documents and supporting information from the manufacturer as soon as they can get it and expedite the review process that they do to still accomplish the same thorough recommendation, but in a shorter time frame. Sydney? Is there anything that that committee could be doing now in anticipation of being approved in June, or do they have to wait until uh, federal approval? Uh, they they don't have to wait for, for a Health Canada approval to be doing this. Just like Cadith, they can g take the information that they're going to be reviewing and start their review process. Uh, I believe that would take them reaching out to the manufacturer and saying, we would like to start our process now. Can you send us, uh, it's called a dossier that they send to Cadith of the, the information that they would typically review. So the committee could reach out to the manufacturer and say, can you send us your dossier now so that we can start the review immediately? Sydney? That's good. Uh, that can help 
aid us in, in recommendations as well. Um, uh, last question. I know uh, it's a significant cost. I mean, I'm sure if, if I was in your shoes, I'd be like, that's not a cost at all. Um, I think I've read like over $300,000 U.S. For, for a year of treatment. Can you speak to what your costs are now or to the 32 CF patients? You know, like what costs are you incurring now anyway that something like this could help negate? Yeah. So it's the, the cost is, is interesting because... One, it's it's a life we're talking about, not dollars and cents, but in terms of cost, we know that the PCPA exists to negotiate down that price, and we can expect at least a 50% cut of that price, because in, in the sense of private insurers that also negotiate with manufacturers their own prices, the manufacturer is going to say, pay a 30% copay, <coughs> that drug supplier is going to pay a middleman 10 percent to manage the deal and then that manufacturer is also going to give let's say another 10 percent to wrap up a g7 country so the the sticker price just like anything expensive is not the price we actually pay uh, as far as my own costs i'm extremely privileged to have private insurance so I do get access to the drugs that I need. If I didn't have private insurance, I would be well north of $7,000 a month in medications that thankfully my private insurance costs. That's on top of the roughly $2,500 a month of medications that I take that are already covered by the provincial formulary. And then in addition to that, to the public cost would be the cost of sending people to a different province for clinic visits and for lengthy hospital admissions that often exceed several weeks. Cindy? Thank you, Sharon. That's the kind of information I was looking for, and I couldn't agree more. You can't put a price on, on you know, a life period or, or certainly the, the improvement of, 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 you know, of living. And uh, that's wildly significant cost, and you say you're, you're, you're lucky to have the insurance, and I'm sure not everybody uh, has done that. We've all been at the benefits and, and the fundraising for these types of things. So um, that is, uh, uh, and I'm impressed with your knowledge and <laughs> how that all works with the breakdowns and, and the adding up of the cost too. So I'm good. Thank you, Chair. Great. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, I just have a, a few questions. Um, Thanks for coming in. This is gonna gonna go a long way, and it's important that Islanders see this. And I know that a lot of kids struggle with this, and it's it's I can't imagine what they what they go through. Can you just talk a little bit about um, if you had any discussions with the chief public health officer regarding um, prioritizing uh, CF patients or people struggling with that for vaccines for for CF? Yeah, so I personally have not had any direct communication with the Public Health Office. I know that Cystic Fibrosis Canada has touched base with public health officials across the country asking that people with CF get moved up that line because of the poor health outcomes of, of the potential of catching COVID-19 and having CF with already devastating respiratory illness. Um, there's been some pushback in certain provinces about uh, whether people with CF should even get the vaccine and questions like that, but uh, my doctors have said to me that as soon as you possibly can fit into a category to get the vaccine, to get into that category and get it as soon as possible because we need as much protection as possible. Okay. So... Um yeah, I, I think it's it's important. What what's it like to uh, to uh, for a CF somebody struggling with CF to to wear a mask and and to abide by the by the rules now? Is it hard? Like your breathing capacity is only you think you said 60 percent. Yeah, like are, is it? Do you do you find that a struggle to be out in public, or do you do you, do patients wear the masks, or do they are they? I know there's some exemptions there, but can you talk a little bit about that or? Yeah, so we, we definitely wear masks. We were wearing masks well before there was a pandemic. Um, something as simple as catching a cold. I caught a cold last year in January and I was in the QEH for 17 days on oxygen and on IV antibiotics. So the although it is more difficult for someone with CF to breathe in a mask, the the risk and benefit is something we obviously have to weigh, and the risk of catching COVID-19 or any virus 
for that matter, is, is far greater than the difficulty of breathing with the mask. Now, that's to say that we also limit our public exposure to, again, uh, have that further layer of protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's great that you're that you're in again. There's obviously there's a there's a change uh, with the Minister of Health, and I hope that that goes well. And this committee, I think, is 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 here to support and um, do anything that we can. So, is there anything that you'd like to say in wrapping up? Oh, might well, Hannah has a question. A few, however many she wants. Hannah. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Hunter. It's really nice to see you in person. Yeah, and thanks for coming in to do this. It's, uh, I know we've, we've talked online, but it's, uh, it's like, oh, there you are. Um, I, I, I'm following on from, from Gord's question, and I recognize just the risk of you being here in, in, in this space. And so, um, you know, it's something that we, we perhaps have taken, take for granted. Um, but um, one of the things that you would brought raised was around the need for a clinic here. Um, and we hear that from a lot of other groups as well. I, I do a lot of work with the Ostomy support group, um, and that's one of the things that they've been asking for as well. So I'm wondering, um, you know, you talked about sort of having that initial conversation with the minister. Would it be, would it be also helpful for us as a committee to, to really speak strongly about the need for that local care? Um, because we, we are more and more hearing about the challenges of people needing either not being able to get sort of that preventative and, and remedial care here or and or that they're just the challenges that come with having to go away. Um, I know I talked to, you know, my colleague has talked extensively about healthcare hubs where you have the opportunity to provide, you know, a broad range of different healthcare services for multiple different challenges within one umbrella. Um, and it's something that, that we have advocated for in the past. So as well as advocating for to be money here available when when and we say when this drug gets approved would help would that health health care service here also be a priority for, for you and, and the people you represent yeah so it's is definitely a priority i would say less so than than access to this medicine um but yeah definitely and especially uh, families with young kids with CF, I imagine the, the burden there is far more than even my own burden of having to take time off work, travel to Halifax, see clinicians there, you know, perhaps visit them just to get a refill on a medication or uh, a new test to try a, a different medication. So the availability of that service here locally would be would provide far greater outcomes for people with CF than them having to travel off island and perhaps not taking as good care of their health because of the the burden that it is to get that care. Anna, yeah, thank you. No, and I, and I absolutely agree that the, you know the priority is to focus on on the adding the the the, the drug, the miracle drug. Um, the process is obviously, um, like you said, complicated because of all the different players involved. Um, but we want to make sure that, you know, we're providing support the right way so that, because we don't want, to, you know, we have to be really careful with the formula, like you said, because there's a, there's a body and a board and then there's the health board and all this other thing. But the key thing is just to, is to make it clear that we expect to see funding in place for this. We don't want to see something else come off the formulary. Uh, we want it, this is an addition and that requires a financial commitment and support commitment. Um, and so that's that's something that the committee could 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 absolutely do for you, I would think, yeah. if we agreed to do so. I think that's pretty pretty yeah. clear. Yeah. But uh, that that's all I have, Chair. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Is the rest of the committee okay? Yeah. Um, so so just wrapping up, you're here. Um, you've done a great presentation. If there was three things that you wanted to leave this committee with, uh, <laughs> you've, you've said a lot of them, but could you just sum them up and? point form and, and, and hit it home, I guess. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess number one would be, like I said, this is the single greatest scientific advancement in CF care, if not perhaps in, in pharma care in general, the ability to repair defective genes and completely change someone's disease and their, the life that they live with that disease is, is mind-blowing, exactly. Um, Secondly, I think that we're in a unique position because of our small population size and the number of CF patients that we have. 
uh, to, to do something about it. Um, I would like to see PEI be the leader in this, considering outside of Manitoba, where there isn't a CF drug program at all, PEI has the worst CF drug program in Canada and often takes more than double the amount of time of other provinces to list a drug on the formulary after Health Canada approval. Um, so I think that with the right leadership and the right action that we could completely flip that upside down and have the best CF drug program in Canada and provide the best health outcomes for people with CF. And I think at the end of the day, it's number three, I guess, would be that these are actual people in our communities that contribute to our communities and, you know, are our friends and neighbors and mothers and fathers and, and children and the ability to give them a more normal life or say even a, a normal life compared to how we live now would be, would have far greater impact than just on their own life. Thank you. Great, Great job, Hunter. And um, so I'd like to thank you for, and then maybe we'll talk, uh, would the committee, would, would the committee like to send a letter to the minister um, or would this be enough or just wait for the recommendations? Is there anything there? Um, at this time in support or just leave it if I may we should we should um, discuss it as but I would I would like like to strongly advocate for us making a recommendation on this sure. but when we do our report that sure. we that we put a recommendation at that okay. time okay. perfect yeah. because the minister is required to respond to the report yeah perfect excellent um, so Hunter thanks for coming in and we'll take a short recess uh, clerk what time is the next presenter scheduled to start um, 10 Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll check that out and we'll take a short break. Great, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, uh, we're moving on to uh, uh, a second part of our, our morning presentation. So we'll pass it over to our guest for his presentation, and then we'll, we'll try to save our questions to the end. And, and I'll pass it over to our guest so you can introduce yourself for Hansard and then begin your presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, everyone. <coughs> I'd like to sincerely express my gratitude to, for the chance to, to walk through an issue that's uh, very near and dear to me. Uh, my name is Brooks Roach, my pronouns are he and him, uh, and I've, a little bit about myself, um, I'll explore this a little bit later, but I've lived with type 1 diabetes for freshly 20 years, so um, this is something that I've been, in, in essence, building up to uh, and following with great interest for, for the vast majority of my life. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity, um, and really what we'll be focusing on today you know, it, it's. I'm just. I'm just very appreciative of this chance. This means a lot to me. We're looking at the case for preventative investments in type one diabetes treatments. The way that I'll be structuring this presentation is telling you a bit about myself and why I'm here, uh, defining the disease further, exploring what treatments and technologies are available right now, uh, examining the burden of type one diabetes on Prince Edward Island right now, looking at where we sit in a national context providing a cost-benefit analysis of uh, what these treatments can do, what they can save, what they'll cost, uh, looking at our opportunity to lead as a province. Uh, and finally, I have four policy recommendations. So a bit about me. Um, as you can tell from the black and white photo, I've been doing this for quite a while. I've um, been <laughs> advocating like for okay. policy change uh, at the <clears throat> provincial and federal level. Um, you may recognize some headlines as I've had the, had the privilege of having some media attention uh, in calling for uh, more inclusive programs and systems relating to diabetes at, again, the provincial and federal scale. Uh, appeared in, in CBC uh, for an op-ed in January. Uh, and, you know, it had the great fortune a couple of years ago to be appointed to the Prime Minister's Youth Council, uh, through which uh, I've had the chance to make a wide variety of policy recommendations and provide a youth lens on the development of policy. What I've used this uh, in part for is to, to push for a national diabetes strategy, to push for changes to the disability tax credit, et cetera. So this is uh, a very central pillar in, in what I see as a, a pathway to a greater province, country, and, and beyond. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't provide a little bit more context, because this is all quite nice and clean and glamorous, and I don't think that's reflective of my experience with the disease. Um, the reason that I'm especially driven to be here today, about two years ago, I, I came to a crossroads. Um, my life was in danger, and I had been, I'd spent my whole life, you know, I still struggled with this and thinking that I could beat diabetes, that I could achieve anything in spite of my illness, my disease. Um, and, and did manage to achieve wonderful things in spite of this and, and you know, power through, so to speak. Um, but I came to a point where I was investing far too much time and energy in my academic pursuits. I was in an incredibly demanding professional program. Um, and at that point, I was being hospitalized on average once every three months. Uh, I was experiencing some dramatic physical uh, and mental symptoms, uh, burnout, exhaustion, um, I, I began to experience early onset symptoms of diabetic retinopathy, which would lead to blindness. And uh, I was terrified. I was a week into my graduate, graduate program at Dalhousie and made the decision that I could either continue and seriously harm myself, or I could drop out and take proper care. And I like to highlight that I had the privilege of making that decision and having access to technologies that allowed me to make a dramatic shift in my own health outcomes and I'm very fortunate to be here and to have this chance because of that. But I'd also like to highlight that not everyone has those opportunities. That's what drives me to be here today. Um, socioeconomic status and access to a job or a private insurance should not determine a person's health outcomes. Um, you know, I'm driven to take care of myself, but I'm also, at a more, more deep fundamental level, driven to give everyone the chance to experience what I've experienced, to have these opportunities, because I know firsthand how much it's changed my life, and uh, I think everyone with type 1 diabetes deserves the same opportunities. So with that, type 1 diabetes, I'd like to define it for you. There are a few fundamental variations of diabetes. Uh, type 1, which I live with, 
type 2, which can be diagnosed or undiagnosed gestational and pre-diabetes. For the purposes of this discussion, we'll be focusing on type 1. Uh, type 1 I'd like to define as it's a chronic condition in which the pancreas produces little or no insulin. It is an autoimmune disease, which unlike uh, these other variations of diabetes, which are metabolic, it's autoimmune, which means that the immune system attacks the beta cells of the pancreas and renders them incapable of producing insulin. Uh, again, there is no cure or prevention for this disease. It can lead to a variety of long-term complications, uh, ranging from heart disease, stroke, blindness, amputation, um, diabetic ketoacidosis, and in, in the most severe cases, seizure, coma, and death. Treatment comes in the form of insulin. Insulin was, was discovered 100 years ago in Toronto. Uh, it's been called Canada's greatest innovation. It's responsible for hundreds of millions of lives saved across the world in the past century, so I can't help but agree with that assessment. Um, about treating the disease, it is constant, it is almost entirely self-directed, uh, and there's really two facets that I like to draw your attention to, and that is monitoring blood glucose and administering insulin. Both of these are required essentially daily to sustain life. <coughs> So a bit more about these. To administer insulin, this can be done through a syringe or pen injection or through an insulin pump. To monitor blood glucose, we can use test strips or an advanced glucose monitor. This is basically the foundational or, or most basic form of care for the disease. Uh, this would couple multiple daily insulin injections with self-monitoring of blood glucose with test strips. Um, essentially, what I'd like to highlight here is that this is the most basic standard of care uh, and what this does is it's all manual so the the patient has to manually inject insulin at meal times or in response to hyperglycemia um, and uh, has to manually check blood glucose receiving only one data point as opposed to trends and there's very little security against adverse events um, again just want to highlight that these are these are constant and these are self-directed there's there's human error at play uh, to give my vocal cords a little bit of a break, I have this video to explain advanced glucose monitoring. Which may be prone to technical errors. Um, I can explain. Uh, advanced glucose monitoring. So this, this chart really sums it up. It's, a, it's a, a monitor that's inserted into the subcutaneous fluid of the body. Uh, and measures blood gl glucose constantly. It's on a, on a scale of every five minutes. This is uh, something that you know human beings just can't replicate. It's it's so accurate. It it demonstrates trends. It demonstrates. Uh, it, it provides alerts against adverse events. So as we can see, you know, looking at uh, the dots on this graph, which represent finger pricks, um, there's entire trends and, and adverse events that are missed, and that uh, you know these can add up and these can really build up and compound into long-term health complications. Uh, fundamentally, think of uh, a parent with a young child living with type 1 diabetes um, who goes to sleep and they, without uh, an advanced glucose monitor, would not have knowledge uh, if there was a hypoglycemic event through the night. Uh, and what those can lead to, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen here, is um, ranging into hyperglycemia can push up into diabetic ketoacidosis, which can be fatal, can lead to renal failure. Uh, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, can lead to um, some, some basic symptoms ranging into seizure, coma, and death. This is uh, this technology, advanced glucose monitoring, is revolutionary, and it, uh, it provides a, an incredible, an incredibly powerful safety net against these adverse events. Uh, finally, insulin pumps. So. These devices are manually changed. This is what I'm wearing right now. Today, they're changed every three days, uh, and they deliver insulin in essentially an intravenous capacity. So it's inserted below the skin, uh, and it provides insulin at a pre-programmed rate, um, essentially in line with the, the body's needs. And this, this changes regularly. This can be in response to, um, you know, obviously consuming food, but it can also respond to uh, stress events such as exercise, uh, lack of sleep, stress. Um, it's an incredibly variable disease, and this provides uh, optimized control. I'd like to also highlight two recent developments in pump therapy, that being sensor augmented insulin pump therapy. This is when a pump is used with an AGM, uh, and what this provides is that they can essentially speak to each other. Um, so rather than the, the patient themselves being a sort of middleman for this technology, um, it, it removes that step. And it goes a step further with hybrid closed loop therapy. This is what I use. This is the most cutting-edge technology. Uh, and having spoken with you know, hundreds of 
of stakeholders in this industry, uh, they've described that nothing, no technology they've seen has this sort of impact on a patient's level of care. It's incredible um, because essentially what it does is it has these two elements of care that communicate with each other algorithmically. So it can actually, you know, examine the trends that are being shown and respond in, t in real time. Um, it's incredible. It's, it's taken away this element of fear in my own life. I can go to sleep comfortably, not wondering, uh, am I going to uh, have a hypoglycemic event through the night? It's a, an incredible element of safety and comfort, and I know that it, uh, it pays dividends down the road. The way to think about that is this. We have these two facets of care. We combine them, and that creates hybrid closed loop systems. So uh, this best replicates pancreatic function and reduces complications. Uh, and it also digitizes patient data. So think about a care provider that can constantly, uh, at any given time, access how is this patient doing? Is there a, a trend that I should be mindful of? Um, and it provides an incredible capacity for virtual care. Final bit of treatment that I'd like to highlight here is amputation prevention devices. And this is, again, a bit more of a downstream approach. This is in response to complications brought on by type 1 diabetes. Uh, right now, uh, diabetes in general, excuse me, right now PEI sees one amputation every 12 days as a result of diabetic foot ulcers. The direct annual cost is $4.3 million. Uh, and what I'm proposing here, uh, I'll give a little spoiler alert, this is one of the recommendations. Um, funding for specialized offloading devices can prevent amputations, free capacity, and save up to $1.1 million per year. Uh, fundamentally, if you look at the, the chart here, this really demonstrates what this does to system capacity. Uh, when an ulcer leads to amputation, it's around 86 days in the hospital, emergency room, and clinics. Uh, when it heals properly, in other words, when it uses this technology that's readily available, simply not accessible, uh, it's, it's around five days. So we're cutting it dramatically uh, and, and freeing those resources. So this time, you know, there, that's a lot of information. I recognize that. Um, I'd like to introduce now, you know, where PEI stands uh, relative to the country uh, and, and how we're doing at providing these services uh, as, as is. Right now, it's estimated that between 800 and 1,600 islanders live with type 1 diabetes. In November, the Department of Health and Wellness announced that uh, the insulin pump program would be expanded to have eligibility ranging from instead of under 18 to under 25. It also announced an increase in the monthly test strip quota from 100 to 120 uh, and launched a new provincial diabetes strategy that ranges until 2024. In addition to this information, what I'd like to highlight is the out-of-pocket costs per year for type 1 diabetics. Now this is uh, national figures, but we're looking at, for someone using multiple daily injections of insulin, it's $1,500 a year. Uh, to use insulin pump therapy, it's between $1,900 and $5,200 per year out of pocket on average. Um, this represents the highest proportional cost in Canada because Prince Edward Island has the lowest median income. These prices do not change based on province. Um, so what we're seeing is, uh, based on the median income, this represents between 5.2 and 18 percent of median income. Imagine spending one-fifth of your income uh, on a disease that you cannot prevent or cure. On this note, uh, where we stack up with the country, essentially 57%, this was a, a recent study done by Diabetes Canada, 57% of Canadians cannot adhere to their prescribed treatment uh, for diabetes due to the high out-of-pocket costs. Again, knowing, uh, knowing PEI's socioeconomic picture, this is undeniably higher here. So, you know, I'd like to highlight uh, how we stack up from a policy perspective. This is sort of broad strokes, but let's get into how our programs compare to other jurisdictions. Uh, coverage of insulin pumps, Prince Edward Island, uh, this is before November's announced expansion. We're still uh, essentially at the bottom of the list. Um, we're one of only five provinces right now that restrict access to insulin pumps in any capacity. Simply put, the, the expansion this year is insufficient. Um, we know that providing it uh, regardless of age is, is the correct policy move. Uh, the program that we've maintained uses uh, what's unique to the Maritimes in means testing uh, for coverage. Uh, and we only provide a maximum coverage of only 90%. In a year when someone might have to start a new insulin pump as well as pay for the supplies, 90% uh, coverage could still leave someone on the hook for $1,000. For a low-income family, this is inaccessible. Uh, just want to highlight that this restricts the safety net provided for Islanders over 25. 
Uh, the province has a duty as the payer of last resort to provide uh, these technologies to those who cannot otherwise access them. What this is doing, when, when we consider an individual over 25 living with type 1 diabetes, which is um, going to be me very soon, there's, there's plenty of folks, that despite its, its colloquial name as juvenile diabetes, this disease impacts folks of all ages. Individuals over 25 do not suddenly, magically have access to employment, to private insurance, and providing this backup, um, this is not a, a handout of pumps to everyone who, could need, who needs one. It's recognizing that in the event that someone cannot access this technology, um, they would not have to stop using it, to, to not have to sacrifice that standard of care, um, simply because of, for example, losing a job, which as we've seen is a, is a fragile circumstance. The national context for advanced glucose monitoring devices. Again, Prince Edward Island uh, does not provide any coverage. Uh, this is not unique among provinces. This is a relatively new technology, but I'd like to highlight that uh, in October and November, respectively, Yukon announced full coverage for continuous glucose monitoring devices. Saskatchewan is introducing funding for residents under 18, uh, and the four largest provinces in Canada are in various stages of pilot projects looking at the implementation of full funding for CGM. So all that being said, Prince Edward Island stacks up at the, at the bottom of the list. And what I really want to highlight is the, the most basic standard of care uh, is providing test strips to self-monitor blood glucose. We, are, we provide the, late, the least comprehensive coverage by a factor of over 100%. Even with November's expansion, uh, which would provide 1,440 strips per year, uh, with no doctor prescribed uh, exemptions, uh, we do not even reach half of the next lowest province, provincial quota. Uh, many provinces provide these as prescribed. This is the Nova Scotian model. Um, and we provide no coverage for those living with type 2 diabetes. So essentially, as well, there are tens of thousands of islanders living with this disease that have no provincially funded way to monitor how they're doing. They have no data on, on their own, uh, you know, how their body is functioning. And this is, this is a failure. I'd, I'd like to highlight this uh, quote that really honestly broke my heart from a, a, a patient with type 1 diabetes living in this province that Prince Edward Island is the worst province in Canada to live with diabetes. I, uh, I, struggle, to, I struggle to hear that and know that that's, that's the reality, but I also know that we can, we can take action on fixing this. So precisely that, where do we go from here? I'd like to walk you through the cost-benefit analysis of funding the aforementioned technologies. So the existing expenses, which I've quantified as direct preventable annual costs of the disease. Um, this does not factor in further downstream complications like uh, ongoing, um, let's say, dialysis for kidney failure. This does not factor in uh, someone who's unable to work, who, who has to uh, move into subsidized housing, for example. Uh, this is direct annual preventable cost. Every hospitalization, uh, which we see an average of one incident per year, uh, is $6,500. That's between five and $10 million uh, annually. For employers, uh, type one diabetic employee costs about $3,000 per year. That's between two and a half and $5 million. Diabetic retinopathy treatments ranges from 2.3 to $4.6 million. Limb amputations directly caused by type one are 600,000 annually. And direct type one diabetes induced kidney failures uh, range 400,000. So if we take a conservative midpoint, again, uh, we lack specificity on how many islanders live with this disease. Uh, but if we take a midpoint, the direct preventable cost of the disease is $15.85 million. The rationale for investing in technologies that can prevent these complications is that they provide improved glycemic control, uh, which reduces both short-term and long-term healthcare costs. Uh, as you can see on the, the chart here, every intervention that's introduced reduces the measure uh, of lasting glucose in the blood, hemoglobin A1c, uh, and I can demonstrate what each 0.5% reduction uh, does uh, in terms of long-term complications. So essentially, uh, what we do when we reduce A1c by providing these technologies is reduce, uh, we reduce A1c, we reduce hospitalizations, paramedic callouts, absenteeism, uh, and instances of ketoacidosis and coma. We increase time and range gold score, which refers to in, uh, individuals who uh, are dangerously hypo-unaware. They cannot 
uh, basically feel any symptoms when they're experiencing an adverse event. Uh, we reduce dramatically instances of this, increase productivity and resource efficiency within uh, for both these individuals and for our healthcare system. Uh, and finally, we can demonstrably demonstrate uh, redundant statement there, uh, we can demonstrate that uh, this improves patient quality of life. So when we reduce A1C uh, to below 7%, and keep in mind that insulin pumps do this, as well as extending life expectancy by nearly 10 years, um, especially when compared with an AGM, what we do is we reduce between 42 and 76%, so cutting between half and three quarters the likelihood of eye disease, kidney disease, nerve disease, cardiovascular complications, uh, non-fatal heart attack, stroke, and death from cardiovascular causes. This is enormous, and this is um, getting into the economics of it. This represents a tidal wave. The question that's being posed is a ripple. The proposed expenses uh, to fully implement optimized type 1 diabetes technology on Prince Edward Island um, is an annual average of 1.74 to 2.84 million dollars. Uh, now, for context, the maximum expenditure here would represent um, essentially the, the most uh, uptake possible. This is 100% of individuals that could possibly benefit from this program using it. Uh, it's full de-restriction of existing programs, access to CGM for all individuals with type 1, uh, and the inclusion of test strips on an as-prescribed basis. Uh, this would equate to a 0.35% increase of the province's health and wellness budget. So what are the benefits, reasonable response? Um, this expense, ranging from 1.7 to $2.8 million, would cut the likelihood of aforementioned health outcomes roughly in half. Uh, and this represents a conservative tripled return on investment. Uh, now the interesting part is, generally speaking about preventive investments, these benefits begin to accrue a decade plus into the future. This happens immediately. Because of the diseases by nature, uh, it has inherent frequency of touch points with the healthcare system. Um, what happens is when an individual stops needing to be hospitalized so frequently, I'm thinking of myself uh, in the past when I was, I couldn't go three months without needing to, to visit the ER. Uh, this technology has freed that up. I haven't, haven't been hospitalized in two years. Consider the impact. That's an individual scale. Expand that to the system of a thousand people. Um, what we do is we free system capacity, we increase resource utilization, and we, and we facilitate virtual care. Uh, especially now, that's, a, that's an extremely valuable uh, added asset of investing in this technology. And finally, just want to highlight the intangible benefits of, of these investments. I mentioned my own uh, peace of mind, ability to pursue other opportunities, to be here today. I don't think I would be able to, to be here presenting if I hadn't made those uh, conscious decisions and, and had the capacity to uh, invest in this technology. Um, you know, the, the, the difference in these thousands of lives, if they have access to this technology, is immeasurable and, uh, and enormous. So just in summary, uh, the long-term <coughs> and short-term paybacks. Long-term, yes, we can delay and prevent altogether micro and macro, macro vascular complications. This is enormous. This is the sort of signature payback of this investment. Uh, we can also reduce the general societal impact. So this is talking about employment uh, and access to, um, you know, an individual's ability to, to live a, a fulfilling life and participate in society fully. But the short-term payback is, is really the nuts and bolts of this. This is where I get excited, frankly. Um, we see reduced, immediately reduced emergency department visits and hospitalizations. We see a reduction in workplace injury. This was proven by a study in uh, construction associations uh, in the Netherlands. We see reduced absenteeism and productivity loss. Uh, right now, uh, especially beneficial, we see a reduction in COVID-19 exposure uh, and use of personal protective equipment. We see an increase in system capacity and minimize wait times for other essential visits. We reduce test strip utilization and cost. So essentially, when we invest in providing continuous glucose monitors, uh, the need for test strips goes down. So that's a, uh, an inverse relationship. Uh, and Interestingly, we see an optimized use of insulin uh, for those who are using both multiple daily inje injections and insulin pumps uh, because this technology allows for more fine tuning of, of dosage uh, and less time in hyperglycemia. So we can actually uh, spend less providing insulin uh, because it'll be more optimized. So all that said, this is, again, recognizing it's a lot of information to, to absorb. Um, I want to close by highlighting DEI's opportunity to lead. This represents, right now, 
you know, it's the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. This is a momentous occasion for Canada, uh, for our position as leader in healthcare and in, in innovation. Um, and just want to highlight, you know, Prince Edward Island was the last province to implement a publicly funded insulin pump. Uh, that only occurred in 2014. As it stands, as I've highlighted, our, our standard of care is the lowest in the nation. Um, this is an opportunity to leapfrog uh, the, the small steps that have been taken and fully comprehensively provide uh, the standard of care that type 1 diabetics type 1 diabetics deserve in this province. So four recommendations. Uh, first, that PEI follow the lead of the majority of Canadian institution, the Canadian jurisdictions uh, and, and the wishes of islanders impacted by this disease. Uh, I, re I receive messages every day saying that people want desperately to have access to a pump or a CGM. They just can't through public programs. Uh, remove the insulin pump program's age discrimination. It's currently set at age 25. Um, this, should, this should not have an age cap. Second, that Prince Edward Island join UConn in setting a national example and introduce full funding for continuous glucose monitors uh, for all islanders in, with type 1 diabetes who need one. Third, that we expand access to blood glucose test strips uh, to meet or exceed a floor of 180 per month uh, with additional strips approved for clinically valid reasons on an individual basis. Uh, and finally, as mentioned, that we introduce public coverage of amputation prevention devices to assist in healing foot ulcers and reducing the risk of amputation. Uh, I'll close with a, a quote that I think sums up how I've been approaching this, this issue, uh, and that's that a problem well stated is half solved. I believe this problem is well stated, uh, and I need, I, in addition to the thousand plus islanders living with the disease, uh, we need action to get it solved. Thank you. Okay, Brooks, uh, uh, thank you for your presentation, and uh, we'll just so we'll pass it over for questions and have a drink. And <laughs> yeah, so we'll start with uh, Zach. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was very uh, informative, uh, very well researched. Uh, my father uh, is diabetic, so a lot of the things you uh, talked about, you know, really kind of shed that light. And it's strange to see, uh, you know, when my uh, his grandchildren, my children go out and see Papa, you know, uh, doing the, the administering of uh, what you talked about. Um, you know, and I do apologize, I have your note here, but I don't actually have the release from Yukon. What was the cost of that, and how many people was that affecting uh, when the Yukon uh, government uh, approved it? I don't have exact figures on cost, but I do know that it was in the range of uh, several hundred individuals living with type 1 in Yukon territory, uh, and that the full implementation was under a million dollars. Zach. Thank you, Chair. Um, when you had mentioned in your slide uh, where I think it said it was 0.35% of the total budget for the Health and Wellness Department, um, and that was if everybody that needed access to uh, either the uh, insulin pump or the uh, glucose monitoring system, that's if everybody uh, is using one? Yeah, that, that's correct. So the 0.35% increase is the, the, essentially the most that could possibly be spent fully implementing this program. And then again, that assumes a 100% uptake, which is based on, you know, based on precedent, it's not going to happen. So that's, that's the absolute ceiling uh, of what this would cost. Is that? No, that's good. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Trish? Thank you, Chair, and uh, Brooks, thank you for this uh, incredible presentation, uh, really uh, very, very um, well thought out, and I really appreciated the cost-benefit analysis. Um, so while there will be that initial um, uh, cost to fully maximize, you know, access to uh, to all services uh, and um, and supports for those with type one diabetes. I mean, the long, the short and long term cost savings are you know quite clear. Um, and when you're looking at the impact on people's lives, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. You know, the the first time I had uh, started looking at some of the you know uh, um, information around uh, the experience of uh, that individuals living with diabetes have, uh, the number of people. Uh, that are experiencing am amputations was that was shocking to me. I mean, a lot. Of, it's all quite shocking, but that uh, that we haven't taken that seriously, and just the cost of, of that piece, and that uh, providing you know offloading devices could make such a difference, a dramatic difference. I mean, that's just one one small part of this story, but it's such a, a critical and clear you know example of if we if we pr 
provide the supports when they're needed, then we can prevent some very drastic things from happening that, you know, are, are just life changing and would, are so, um, just limit, you know, uh, uh, life experiences beyond that, right? So, um, you know, I think uh, it, it's, it, it's 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 hard for me to understand why why we're still sort of you know having these discussions about the because it's so clear to me what what the benefits would be and and I, I do hope that uh, that we see uh, progress um, you know when government announced that uh, the insulin pump program would be uh, you know expanded to uh, age 25 I mean that you know really is it's such a small step. Uh, so, you know, what what kind of, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the experience um, is for those living with diabetes, knowing that they're going to age out of a program that provides uh, this, you know, life uh, support system, uh, you know, for them. Absolutely. It, um, thank you for the question. Um, because I think that's that's it's a difficult one to quantify. I like to often stick to what I can point to and what I can demonstrate in stats and figures. But this is a feeling, um, and it's a feeling of lack of security because the restriction is entirely arbitrary. There's no evidence that points to the fact that this should be restricted at age 25. And I think what we see is an unnecessary stress placed on the individual living with the disease, recognizing that. At age 25, likely, this person will have access to private insurance through an employer. Um, but in the event that they do not, for whatever uh, reason may pop up, and this, this can be entirely out of the person's control. There could be a, a pandemic, for example, um, that, that costs someone a job and, and access to this, this form of insurance. Um, knowing that there's a possibility that someone might have to essentially downgrade their standard of care and sacrifice something like eight years off their projected lifespan, that's not a decision that should be uh, foisted on anyone. Uh, that it's, it's incredibly harmful, um, obviously from a, from a financial and from a, a personal well-being perspective, but also from a, honestly, if we want to consider the mental health impacts of not having that guarantee that one can continue with a technology that's provided opportunities and that's improved uh, quality of life, uh, it's incredibly damaging. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and I think, you know, you make such an important point that, you know, uh, while many, there are people that would have access to private ins insurance through their employment, uh, not everybody does. And we do have, uh, you know, a very precarious uh, labor force in many ways here in Prince Edward Island with uh, seasonal labor and, and contract work. And that's across the country as well is, is growing in terms of contract work and, and, uh, and uh, that precarious, uh, the precarious nature of work. So we can't expect that um, everybody is going to necessarily have access to that private insurance and um, you know I really appreciated what you're sharing about the impact on individuals but I think you know and also the impact on the system that there are additional costs when we don't put the upfront resources in place there there are costs for a healthcare system when you know we see uh, you know eye, eye disease kidney disease nerve disease all of these other impacts that happen down the line and not very far down the line um, when we don't provide it uh, when you uh, provided the um, annual average uh, cost analysis, uh, 1.74 to 2.84 million. Did that take into account um, uh, those who might have access to private insurance or was that um, not? Yes, yeah, that, did, that did. And that was developed uh, in tandem with a model uh, both used by JDRF Canada and Diabetes Canada. Uh, and this is the costing model in, in detail for reference. Okay. That's good to know. Um, and, uh, you know, so that would be the upfront cost, but then when we look at the the savings. I mean, really, you've uh, presented that quite clearly. So, all right. I think that's those are all the questions great. I have for now, Chair. Thank you. Hannah. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Brooks. It's great to see you. Um, one of the things you've said many amazing things, and thank you so much for for taking something like this and presenting it in such a, a clear process. And others have said that as well. But um, it, it makes, like you said, it, it by presenting it half solved makes it an awful lot easier to bring forward as an immediate actional policy. A couple of things though, that you said that I wanted to come back to. You said you don't actually know for sure how many people there are. How do we not know? <laughs> I'm really baffled by that, given that the severity and, and, the, and the, the requirement for support, is there not a coordination of, of, of a central database or anything? It's an excellent question. I wish I had a clearer answer for, yeah. for why that's the case. Um, 
again, it's, it's, it's a staggering range of it, it's 800 to 1600. That, that represents a, a wild difference in making policy decisions and costing yeah. these moves. Um, I think it is fundamentally, it's a, a lack of continuum of care. Um, there's uh, essentially type 1 diabetics are often diagnosed uh, as a pediatric patient and then have to be phased into uh, a different, whether it's an endocrinologist or a, a different specialist. Um, oftentimes that transition is incredibly difficult and overlaps with moving provinces with other major life steps and uh, unfortunately what we see often is individuals that are, are lost in the shuffle uh, and that are no longer essentially accounted for uh, and are left to manage this disease almost entirely on their own and only touching base with the system uh, when a severe complication inevitably rears its head. So I think it is a, a system level problem. Um, now looking at, for example, the implementation of a national strategy would see uh, a national uh, basically registry of individuals living with the disease. We, we lack that right now uh, and I think it's an incredibly valuable investment and that's to, to, that ought to be pushed for at both the national and provincial scales. So that's maybe, uh, again, there, there are multiple roots of this tree, um, but that's, uh, that's a really significant one, is just a lack of continuum of care between an individual when they're diagnosed and when they're receiving early care, uh, between when they're you know, 24, 28, 60, whatever. Um, it's, it's often difficult to bridge those together. Hannah? Thank you for that. And that, and that kind of, I guess, <clears throat> this comes up a lot you know, when we talk about um, some of these sometimes some of these large problems when that you know are unfortunately not easy to solve and so like you said in one aspect we have you know here's these four things that you can do and there and there's a cost involved and but we also have that that other piece of it which says you know are we actually reaching people are we supporting them are we educating because that's also part of the prevention um if somebody doesn't know about the need to take care of their foot ulcers and they don't have somebody they can go to with, they don't have a GP, they don't know about the, the that there are supports available, um, then it, you know, we can have all the supports in the world, but if we can't connect those to the people that need them, and as you said, also that accurate costing, it seems like an awful lot of sort of, <coughs> eh. <laughs> um, I do know, uh, just very recently working with um, a, a constituent who has been recently diagnosed um, and was told that their first referral with a specialist would be in May. Um, and so in the meantime, you know, there's just this, this what are you supposed to do? Uh, um, and and um, now that I understand as well, sort of in terms of type two, that we're talking about 16,000 is the number that I had heard from, the, from Diabetes Canada. Again, an estimate because not everybody is even diagnosed, let alone in any kind of treatment program. Does that, is that also, I know it's not the topic, but I just, in terms of scale, Yes, uh, good memory. Uh, first of all, it is 16,000 living with type 2 diabetes uh, and all together uh, when we factor in pre-diabetes, which is now a recognized condition, which means an elevated level of glucose in the blood that predisposes someone to develop uh, type 2. Uh, there are 50,000 islanders, one in three, living with some form of this disease. Hannah? It, it's, it, uh, as my colleague said, it's very difficult to sort of hear some of these numbers, I think, in all of this, one of the most shocking, you know, I am, because I am familiar on a, the national programs and, and some of these numbers, as you've mentioned, but the amputation number um, is, it's not just shocking, it's horrifying. Um, and that's, that is such a, I mean, we, I talk, I work a lot with people with disabilities um, and people on social assistance and, and people who are really struggling in the system already. And the idea that you could actually prevent somebody from entering into something which is so much harder than where they already are with a relatively small investment um, is, is really difficult. Um, I, I, I recognize the challenge that you have speaking about it as somebody who's living in this, let alone the challenge that we have hearing it. Um, with your recommendations and the costing that you've got with them, have you had the opportunity to present this to anybody in the Department of Health, or is, it, am I, am, or is this something that they already know? So I can, I can confirm that this, uh, essentially this presentation, or a, a simplified version of this, was presented to the uh, Department of Finance uh, in their pre-budget pre -budget consultations, uh, and it's been circulated to the Department of Health uh, and the Minister. Uh, including the recently appointed uh, Minister Ernie Hudson. Um, so again, it is in their hands, um, and the, I 
you know, I, I, I won't say that it, they're not aware of these figures because it's, it's staggering and it's systemic. And when we realize one in three individuals in the province uh, is directly impacted by this, um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a silent tsunami and it will, it will crash. Anna? Yeah, and, and I can also confirm that I know we, in our submission to the, um, the budget from the official opposition office, also included as I can't remember the exact ask, and my colleague will probably be able to tell me, but because uh, my computer has just died, but um, it is um, we we did also seek for for um, investment into same without necessarily having this level of, of detail. Um, I, th I think one of I guess your final point that that you know we talk a lot about. Um, dollars investment, but this we are talking also about um, quality of life for for individuals like, like yourself, people who are part of our community. Um, and the idea that, that some members of that community or a large number of that community are, are not able to experience a quality of life because they just literally can't afford it, um, which means that they have, they are treated differently with through no action of their own. Um, and that, I think that's the core of something we need to, we need, we need to continually remember is with, with all of the costing and everything else that we're talking about, hundreds and thousands of, of islanders who are our friends and our neighbours and our families, um, and that this is about everybody deserving to have the same opportunities. So I, I really appreciate you bringing this forward, but that's always the piece that I think about is, is um, what this feels like as a, as a, for you and as a person. Um, um, who, who has to talk about this as objectively as possible when it's also your own lived experience. So thank you very much for doing that for us today. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I appreciate the, the appreciation. Um, and I'll, I'll just... <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll just... I'd like to follow up on that and say that I'm sometimes asked um, why, if this is such a big issue, why aren't more people talking about it? And it's because people that live with this are exhausted. People that live with this disease have Im immeasurable impacts. There, there are you know the there are parents that don't sleep. There are kids that you know like myself growing up. I I didn't have the same opportunities as those around me. As much as I wanted them, and as much as uh, I, I thought that I could power through, as I mentioned earlier, this takes a heavy toll, and that's physical, mental, emotional, financial. Um, and we can relieve that burden. And I think um, you know I view myself as a bit of a success story. And I can't help but wonder if we provide a thousand people with that next step up, what can come from that? You know, it's a, it's an it's an encouraging prospect. Um, Fifty-seven percent can't meet the treatment levels. Um, so, can you talk a little bit more about that? Is that strictly financial, or is that we talked about diagnosis too with with doctors in our system? Um, that's, a, that's an amazing number. So, so that figure uh, is from 2018 from a very large national survey done by Diabetes Canada, and it determined that 57% of Canadians who are diagnosed with diabetes um, cannot meet all of their prescribed treatments purely because of the out-of-pocket cost. Um, type 1 average out-of-pocket cost per year um, can reach as high as $15,000. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, as mentioned, for a province with a low median income, that is the the impact of that is incredible. I can't imagine someone having to budget: Do I buy my insulin, or do I pay rent, or do I get groceries this month? That is a, not a decision that you know. Obviously, we we are fortunate in many ways to have the systems we do, but they're they're not perfect, and there are gaps that folks fall through, and uh, we end up paying the the consequences either way. So to provide folks with this guarantee that they will have access to the best technologies that are proven to help them, um, that's where we can avoid that, you know, that staggering impact down the line. And yet 57% is appalling. I, when I saw that, I thought that must be, must be 5.7. There's, there's no way that that over half of individuals living with this disease, keep in mind that's, that's millions of Canadians that mm -hmm. cannot afford to do what their doctor prescribes them to do to take best care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about mental health, and uh, you know, I know that that people struggling with diabetes and type one diabetes, it's got to affect their mental health. Um, we look at it; they can't they can't get treatment. Um, what's it like to to communicate with others who have this 
type and type one in the community. What is the, I mean, you put up one slide there where, where somebody said that PEI wasn't doing so well. Um, what's it like in the, the community? What's the sense in the community? Well, first of all, it's, um, I appreciate the question because it, it is a community. It's, there's a, an incredible barrier that these individuals have had to overcome and, and continue to try to overcome. Um, and when I communicate with these people, there's a sense of historically uh, apathy. There's a sense this issue is too big and too slow moving that, you know, what's the use speaking up? What's the use sharing my story or calling for change? Um, and I believe wholeheartedly that that tide has begun to turn. Um, there's a, a sense that this is so clearly the right move um, that we ought to speak up about it. I've certainly taken on that, that approach. Um, the sense within the community regarding, well, on the note of mental health, there is now a, a diagnosable condition named diabetes distress, which is a, a, a tendency toward um, both uh, depressive and, uh, and depressive thinking and anxiety directly as a result of the implications of this disease. Uh, there's something like 200 extra decisions that a type 1 diabetic has to make every day. Uh, and those, those are not, uh, you know, what do I add to my coffee? Those are, it, can I do this thing without suffering severe health consequences? Can I, you know, am I able to go to work today uh, because I, I slept for 30 minutes last night because I was caring for a hypoglycemic event? Um, these are, you know, the gravity of what's being dealt with is, is enormous. Uh, and within the community, there's a shared recognition of that. And beyond this, this ap learned apathy, I suppose, there's a, a desire to, at some level, ask for what's deserved. Yeah. And we look at, um, we look, I like to look a lot about wellness, and, 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 and it just doesn't, doesn't seem like we're on the right side of wellness when it comes to type 1 diabetes, where we're not given enough support to, to, to live well within your within your community struggling with this. So I think there's some definitely some room here to to move. Um, just, just right, is it, Heath has a question, Heath McDonald. Well, I just, you know, I've, you know, I've listened to you, Brooks, and you articulate this situation extremely well, and it is, it's a challenge for you, obviously, personally, but obviously with the numbers so many more. And, you know, I was writing down as you were speaking about wellness and preventive medicine and, and I, you kind of look at some of the other health situations when you talk about smoking and cancer and the amount of money, the millions and millions and millions that we spend on that. And it's all relevant to exactly what you're saying in regards to how it affects possibly mental health of individuals and the longevity of it. And I can uh, speak from a little bit of experience just recently at a, a neighbor who was had both legs amputated. So I think, I, I don't know what the answer is. I think uh, as government officials, and, and even when we were in government, there should have been more done. Um, I think there should be more done today. I think it is preventive me medicine. I think the cost associated with it, sometimes I think that gets lost in the bureaucracy of we're dealing with today, so let's deal with today, as opposed to looking down the road and saying, here's what this is going to do to our budget in three years, five years. I don't think there's enough of that. There's not enough forecasting on mental, mental illness either. And I think, um, I think your, your advocacy has to continue. I think you need to just keep pushing the envelope. I think everybody, everybody on this side of the house, we're here because we want to represent people and we care for people. So this significantly is that impact of why we're sitting over here. And I think eventually you're gonna, you're gonna take this across the finish line. So keep doing what you're doing. I think there's a bigger picture that they can't just use the word diabetes. I think mental health is extremely important. And the cost of healthcare continuously increases five, 10% a year. This could be significant uh, cuts to that. And I think there's not enough people forecasting far enough in advance to see the benefits, not just to the individuals, but to the island as a whole. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, thank you, Heath. And I, I'd like to touch on two points you made. Um, the first being, you know, 
getting caught in the day-to-day uh, versus building a legacy. And that ex- is exactly what this represents. It's ch- a chance to cement a legacy of listening to folks who are calling out that this, this gap exists and it needs to be filled. Um, and, you know, it, it can be done not immediately, but it, it can be put in place and the results will follow. Um, and I just think it's, it's a, a chance to build something that can be looked back on with a lot of pride. Um, It certainly would be from the thousands of islanders directly impacted by the disease. It would be an incredible day to to know that anyone who needs this technology could get it. Um, And the second piece, uh, you know, talking about um, getting it across the finish line. And that's, you know, being here today, I, I, as mentioned, I'm so appreciative and um, I've done a lot of thinking about what it means to be here in this space with you all. I'm, I'm very grateful for it. And to get this across the finish line, um, I need some help. You know, I need I need help from within this room and, and beyond. And um, you know, whether that's in the form of, of writing a formal letter or whether that's bringing this up within caucus meetings, um, whatever it may be, anything that could be done to further this cause and, and move it across the finish line would be incredibly appreciated by myself and thousands of others. Hannah. I don't know if, uh, are we going to be able to get a copy of your presentation? Would that be able to share that with the? That would be great. Just because um, I couldn't write fast enough <laughs> to keep the data. In. Um, and I would, I would agree, Brooks. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think we should be. We can't, we can't download the responsibility of this onto you. You know, this is that you. You are a very strong advocate, and you're the you're the person that opens the door. Um, but it is the responsibility of the people in, in this space and and that we who we work with to to do the next part um, and so you know it, it's always um, it's often quite a challenge to sit in these committees because you know, I'm continually thinking that you know I've heard the most shocking thing or the most amazing thing or whatever I'm going to hear and then I get this <laughs> and um, and so to have two presenters in a row who are telling us about a, a space that that I, we don't know perhaps as much about as we should is, um, is a, a reminder but I'm really I'm also really aware of how heavy burden this is to be an advocate um, and so you know part of the commitment I think for this um, committee and for the work that we do is to is to not just have you come in and present and then leave and have nothing happen um, and that's something that we can do through committee is is make decisions on what those actions are um, so again I really appreciate that the that piece but also want you to know that certainly from my perspective um, support goes there's a balance there Thanks. Perfect. Um, yeah, I'd just like to thank you, too, uh, for coming in. Great job. And I think you you left us with some, definitely some, some good pieces, and, and, um, and uh, you've done very well today. So is there anything you want to say in wrapping up or anything like that? Or before we give the... I, I'd just like, once again, to, to thank, um, you know, thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for the invitation and everyone on the committee for, for hearing me out and... Uh, and recognizing that this is a this is a, a significant problem, uh, but it has a really equally significant solution. Um, it's urgent and it's it's a large issue. Um, and uh, you know, I, I was asked earlier what the sentiment is from Islanders impacted by this disease, and it's a sense of urgency. If I could sum it up in one word, it's that this needs to happen quickly. Um, you know, I, I'll just uh, I'll leave with, on the note of preventive care, one of my favorite quotes. I know I already threw one in, but um, Abraham Lincoln was once asked if he had six hours to cut down a tree, what he'd do, and he said he would spend the first four sharpening the axe. This is a chance to sharpen the axe. Well done. Um, I'll just ask for the, the permission of the committee right now. Can we move to number five? If Because uh, we're coming back this afternoon. So is there any new business at this time? Okay, no new business. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn the, this meeting this morning? Uh, Heath McDonald. So we'll adjourn to 1.30 this afternoon. Okay, thanks again, guys.